Good evening. On behalf of the Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future, I welcome you to the sixth and concluding lecture by Dr. Amartya Sen, uh, Nobel Laureate and Pardee Visiting Professor uh, of Futures Studies. The, this sixth lecture is entitled, as is the entire six-part series, lecture series, The Future of Identity. And Dr. Sen will speak for about an hour and then take questions. And as usual, there'll be a brief reception uh, after the question period. Uh, it's my honor to present Dr. Sen. In a letter written in 1818, John Keats, the poet, complained about his brother Tom. Tom's identity, Keats grumbled, presses upon me so all day that I am obliged to go out. It's not hard to understand what Keats meant. We have all been obliged to go out from time to time under similar provocation. But that euphemism about an apparently exasperating brother is also an example of the marvelous plasticity of the term identity. While I have tried in this series of lectures to discuss the idea of identity from different perspectives, I'm under no illusion that there is going to be a consensus on how this tangled concept is to be exactly interpreted, and even less on how the word identity is to be used. Keats remains forever empowered to resent his brother's identity. What we have to scrutinize and clarify is not so much the right use of a term, but the substantive idea of our belonging to a group, of being a member of a collectivity, and the implications, if any, of our manifest membership of that collectivity or of a sense of belonging that goes with it. I have, in fact, tried to argue in the previous lectures that the significance of identity in this general sense is frequently misinterpreted on the basis of underanalyzed presumptions and thus that this can sabotage our intellectual comprehension of social relations and may even have terrible consequences in practice. Even though the series of lectures and its subject matter and title were chosen long before September 11, the horrifying events in New York and what has followed since then have provided terrible illustrations of some of the worst fears one could entertain. I should clarify that my thesis is not that these dreadful events can be well understood or explained, explained as resulting from identity conflicts, as it is sometimes claimed, or from some inescapable clash between distinct cultures to which we respectively belong. In fact, quite the contrary. My claim rather is that intellectual confusions of the nature of identity combined with purposive manipulation by sectarian warriors has directly contributed to the vulnerability of our lives in addition to impoverishing us in other ways. And the example of September 11 is just one example among very great number of um, vulnerabilities that we face. Indeed, to try to explain some confrontation as a product of conflicting identities, to try to do that, would be close to not offering any explanation at all, since we have to ask why distinct identities have to take an adversarial form. Also, since each of us have many different identities consistently with each other, we also have to ask how a particular element of a diversity of identities can assume such a predominant position that it works 
as a powerfully belligerent party in a harsh social conflict? These questions are not rhetorical. The point is not that the associative implications of different identities could not be hostile to each other, nor that the preeminence could not possibly be given sorry, nor that preeminence could not possibly be given by a person to exactly one out of his many different identities. These possibilities certainly exist, but it has to be analyzed why and how identities and their implications may take that form. The real work of causal explanation would have to be located in this investigation, rather than in the airing of the vapid formula masquerading as a profound diagnosis that an identity conflict is the cause of the clash. To opt explicitly or by implication for the view that distinct and divergent identities must lead to a strife or even to some substantial friction begs some very basic questions about the nature and significance of the idea of identity. Those questions have to be asked, and the role played by the fomenting of trouble through playing up identity differences and their alleged enmity is a particularly good subject for social study. The crude rhetoric of identity conflict can most certainly be used for aggravating purposes, and it has recurrently been so used. If such incendiary use draws on and exploits misconceptions about the nature of identity, then a critique of the intellectual foundations of identity-based reasoning can have great practical importance in addition to whatever conceptual relevance it may have. The need for that engagement has been one of the motivations for trying what I'm trying to do in this series of lectures. Since the first four lectures in this series of six were given between last November and February, some dreadful events in Gujarat in India have provided new illustrations of manipulative imposition of barbarically confrontational identities with beastly results. Even though the crisis was made dramatically worse by the utter dereliction of duty by the state government of Gujarat to carry out its policing functions, it was criminally incompetent, or more likely far worse than incompetent. Ultimately, these issues of life and death raise deep intellectual questions as well as political and administrative ones. Misinterpretation of what is demanded by one's allegedly predominant identity, in this case as a Hindu or, or as a Muslim, is fed by captivating instigation to violence dressed up as a call of duty in the cause of that identity. Peter Sellers says in a famous interview, I quote, there used to be a me, but I had it surgically removed. The removal of oneself, one's self, would be challenging enough, but no less radical is the imposition, a surgical implantation of a quote unquote real me by others who propel us in the direction of a new and belligerent view of ourselves with brutal consequences. We are suddenly informed that we are not really what we took ourselves to be. We are not actually Yugoslavs, but specifically Serbs. You and I don't like Albanians, or not just Rwandans, but Hutus. We hate Tutsis. Or, in some, or as some of us from the subcontinent old enough to remember the bloody 1940s, that we are not primarily Indians or subcontinentals or human beings, but in fact only Hindus or simply Muslims or just Sikhs who must respectively confront those on the quote-unquote other side. The imposition of a fiercely confrontational identity 
through an engineered political process can drown other affiliations and commitments, as well as normal considerations that human beings can be expected to have towards each other. A great many of the contemporary political and social issues revolved around the conflicting claims of disparate identities, since the idea of belonging and the conception of identity can have or can be made to have far-reaching effects on our lives. I began the first of this series of lectures with some elementary thesis about the nature of our identities, and perhaps in this last lecture, I should go back to them, particularly in light of what has been discussed in the previous five lectures in the series. One basic thesis with, with, which I have been, with which I began, and with which I've been concerned in every lecture, in one way or another, in, in many, many different ways, is the inescapable plurality of our identities. We are influenced by, even proud of, our membership of particular groups. But there are many such groups to which we can simultaneously belong. This is a very elementary point, which I made at the very beginning of the first lecture, but one that is very often missed, resulting in argument from a deeply flawed premise, indeed, this invocation to, to violence as a part of your duty, to which I referred earlier to Gujarat and, and many other of these examples, really draw on that falsity, on that false premise. There's, in fact, no contradiction whatever, in a person's having a profusion, a large profusion of identities. For example, to illustrate, to vary an example I considered earlier, a person can be of Chinese origin, a Malaysian by nationality, a devout Buddhist, a dedicated socialist, an expert in Greek and Latin, a fine rap artist, a determined gardener, a dedicated solver of crossword puzzles, a good badminton player, a fanatical soccer fan, and also one of those rare persons who can actually touch the tip of their nose with their tongue. Their own nose, I should explain. <laughs> Depending on the context, and here we can give ourselves some flight of imagination of possible circumstances, especially in dealing with touching the tip of your nose, each of these memberships, and indeed a great many others, can be the source of an important affiliation with considerable significance, depending on the context. And when the inclinations associated with the respective identities get in each other's way, a person has to decide, explicitly or by implication, what importance, if any, to give to any particular identity that she or she has among the cluster of coexisting identities. Any particular identity can be mildly relevant or pivotally momentous, or on the other side, of no practical import whatsoever, which it would be does not follow from the fact that the person has that particular identity among others. The decision has to be made about relative importance. Indeed, reason choice is a central necessity in the intelligent weighing of one's identities. The acknowledgement of an identity of one's membership of a group does not have any immediate implication for what one should do or how one should see other people. It's critically important to see the role that reasoning and scrutiny can play in the choice of the relative importance of our different senses of belonging and our membership of distinct groups, and therefore in determining the practical implications of the totality of our identities. This thesis can be contrasted with contrary positions which have been championed, and which I discussed in the first lecture, but in my last lecture I'm trying to cover the ground fully, taking a more synoptic view. Contrary positions which have been championed that dispute our freedom to choose. I have discussed in the earlier lectures 
the communitarian presumption that somehow we can arrive at the importance of a specific identity of ours by a mere act of discovery. The claim is that knowing that identity is much the same as acknowledging its central importance, so that many things will simply follow from that act of discovery. I have argued why this position reflects a basic confusion about what is involved in acknowledging an identity. Let me illustrate the issue with an example. It's not an example I used earlier, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's, I think, quite central to the kind of question I'm looking at. We can indeed discover an identity of ours in the sense that we may suddenly find out that we have a connection, or perhaps a descent, of which we were previously unaware. In Rabindranath Tagore's wonderful Bengali novel, called Gora, the problematic hero, also called Gora, zealously champions conservative Hindu customs and is a staunch traditionalist. He is portrayed quite sympathetically. He is portrayed as someone who greatly despises what he sees as westernization of India. So this traditionalism has some um, moral connection and wants to dissociate himself from, mid, from the middle class elite in favor of earthy customs and beliefs of what he takes to be the populace. It is also the form that Gora's egalitarianism takes, and he in eloquently explains, elaborates, and defends, in beautiful prose, his deep sense of identity with the common people by using his uncommon argumentative power. However, towards the end of the novel, Tagore places Gora in some confusion when his sub supposed mother tells him that he was actually adopted as an orphaned infant by his Indian family after his Irish parents had been killed by the mutineers in 1857, in the so-called Sepoy Mutiny. The name Gora in Bengali means fair, and presumably his unusual looks had received some attention, but no clear diagnosis. At one stroke, Gora's militant conservatism is undermined by Tagore, since Gora recognizing that all doors of traditionalist, traditionalist temples were closed to him because of the exclusionary nature of the conservative cause which he had himself championed. This was discovery enough, but Gora still has to decide how he must see himself now. Indeed, even when a person discovers something very important about himself or herself, there are still issues of choice to be faced. The person who discovers that she is Jewish, which she did not know perhaps earlier, would still have to ask what importance to give to that identity compared with other competing identities of nationality, of class, of political belief, and so on. Gora too had to ask whether he should continue his championing of Hindu conservatism, though now from an inescapable distance, or see himself as an expatriate Irishman, or as a Westerner, or as something else. As it happens in Tagore's novel, Gora finds reason to see himself just as a human being, not delineated by religion or caste or class or nationality. It was a decision for him to make rather than something for him to passively discover. There is no way of avoiding the choice of priorities or weights. Decisions have to be made even when discoveries occur, as they do occur. And it makes a difference what choices we actually do make. Unreasoned acceptance of the alleged implications of one's identity has been, as I have been discussing, the source of a great many barbarities in the world. The denial of the role of choice in favor of the an allegedly canonical role of discovery adds greatly to the flammability 
of the world in which we live. In defense of the discovery view, the argument is sometimes made, which I also have tried to discuss, that situated in a particular community and a specific culture, a person may not actually have access to other conceptions of identity and to other ways of thinking about affiliation. Her social background, her community and culture may in this view determine the patterns of reasoning and conceptions of ethics and of rationality that are available to him or her. As I discussed, I think it was in the third lecture, as to how the, it's become quite fashionable, in fact, in answer to invocation of ideas of rationality or justice to say which, whose rationality, which justice. As I quoted Bartha Chatterjee, the social theorist, in the third lecture explaining this position, this view relates closely to the belief that, I quote, each culture could have its distinctive system of logic which would make the beliefs held by people in that culture thoroughly incommensurable with beliefs held in other cultures. And what seems to us to be an intelligent, intelligible reason for acting may not be so for others." Unquote. I have already discussed why the limitations of intelligibility are far more extensive. Sorry. Why the uh, boundaries of intelligibility are far more extensive than the cultural separatists tend to allow, and how the intellectual pessimism about the possibility of cross-cultural critical examination is actually fed by a confusion between intelligibility and agreement. Intelligibility and agreement are in fact quite different things. Indeed, a position has to be intelligible to us before we can really disagree with it. And to confound the two is at the root of some of the imagined problems in cross-cultural dialogues. This is a very old issue, even though it keeps recurring again and again. And it has been addressed over thousands of years, as people have traveled from one country to another, from one culture to another, one continent to another, observed differences, sometimes learn from each other, or alternatively disapproved of the way others behave. I tried to illustrate in one of those lectures with the example of Ibn Battuta, the 14th century traveler, who roamed the world, starting from Morocco, had no difficulty in distinguishing. I mean, he did, as he roamed the world, he went to uh, Africa, way down south. He went to India and other parts of Asia. He had no difficulty in distinguishing between what he could follow and what he approved of. And indeed, he's a very acute observer. For example, in Mali, and I'm going to come back to the story of Mali, he notices that there is a matrilineal uh, um, inheritance of property in a part of the community. Uh, he strongly disapproves of it. And then he says that you have not, I have not seen it excepting in the barbaric custom in, in referring to Kerala. Uh, and we know that that, of course, um, exists. But this is one of the earliest references, 14th century, of, of the matrilineal property. So even Batuta is not only disapproving, he's disapproving them in categorized form, saying that this exists somewhere else. And I disapprove of it strongly, as I did there too. Batuta. Um, understood, for example, how the Malians and Ghanians further south in Africa uh, than Morocco, which he visited, allowed greater freedom to women to mix with men other than their husbands. Not because, by the way, religion, because in the case, both groups that you were looking at, the Malians as well as Moroccans are both Muslims, but the native traditions are different. At the same time, Batuta while seeing the different, strongly disapproves of what he calls this laxity. Well, Abu Muhammad, the Malian gentleman who befriended Batuta, on his turn, lectured Batuta on the importance of Malian values, explaining, I quote from Abu Muhammad, 
the association of women with men is agreeable to us and a part of good conduct to which no suspicion attaches, unquote. And he went on to add that Malian women, I quote, are not like the women of your country, unquote. Even Batuta decided, I mean, he followed the argument, but he decided that this was entirely mistaken and he must shun the company of this gentleman. He decided to leave the Malian, the, uh, the, the Malian perpetrator and quote unquote, not return thereafter. Later on, Batuta adds, he invited my, me several times, but I did not accept. We may be able to follow each other very well, even when we do not like what we follow. Intelligibility is by no means the same as approval, even though with intelligibility, there of course always is scope for rethinking and reassessment, and indeed much of the hope of the future and of the world. The denial of intelligibility in some of the communitarian literature cuts the root of possible communication and the intellectual engagement that could follow from it. As I also discussed, some early theorists put particular emphasis on the constructive role of learning about and interacting with others precisely because they saw it as a way, consciously saw it as a way of avoiding conflict and even bloodshed. It's not often recognized how often this issue that we discussed today have been discussed over much longer than thousands of years. Of course, in India, there's a good case of not only Buddha, but the Emperor Ashoka, whom I discussed in one of the lectures, discussing exactly that question in some detail. I also cited the example of Al-Biruni, an Iranian, born in Central Asia in 973 AD, so in the last but one millennium, who wrote in Arabic, who was a very distinguished, um, uh, sorry, uh, who wrote in Arabic, who was a very distinguished mathematician, and authored the classic book on Indian civilization, concentrating particularly on mathematics and science and culture, but also on other aspects of Indian civilization. Al-Biruni first visited India in the company of the invading army of Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni, one of the um, most brutal of the um, foreign tribes that, at, uh, the foreign group that attacked India, having a similar uh, reputation um, to Genghis Khan and so on in the European context. And he went on to write about his revulsion, that is, Al-Biruni went on to write about his revulsion at the atrocities committed by his barbaric patron. He stayed on in India after, after Mahmud had gone back, mastered Sanskrit, studied Indian texts on mathematics, natural science, literature, philosophy, and religion, produced a better Arabic translation of Brahmagupta's famous Sanskrit treatise on astronomy and mathematics, the previous translation was done 300 years earlier in the 8th century. al book on India presents a very clear account of the intellectual traditions and social customs of ele early 11th century India. But he explained the, his motivation for spending so much time on this in the following way. And I'm quoting here from al -Biruni. In all manners and usage, the, Indias differ, the Indians differ from us to such a degree as to frighten their children with us, with our dress, with our customs and our ways, and as to declare us to be devil's breed and our doings as the very opposite of all that is good and proper. We must, however, confess, in order to be just, that a similar depreciation of foreigners not only prevails among us and among the Indians, but is common to all nations towards each other." Unquote. Given that general motivation, Al-Biruni explained in the concluding chapter of his book, when he's quite happy he had finished his book, as to what he had aimed to do in the book, and I quote that again. We think now that what we have related in this book will be sufficient for anyone 
who wants to converse with the Indians and to discuss with them questions of their religion, science, or literature on the very basis of their own civilization." Unquote. No fear of unintelligibility there. Indeed, there are good reasons to see a very important message in Al-Biruni's demonstration, what may even be called in the language of mathematics a constructive proof of the non-necessity of premature abdication of efforts towards intercultural communication on which cultural separatists tend habitually to rely. Community and culture, while influential in many different ways, do not obliterate our comprehension of how others think, nor indeed do they rule out our ability to think differently from the way traditionalists think when we have the opportunity to do so. As it happens, the advocacy of traditionalism often comes from brand new theories, and there are hundreds of examples of that, and the Taliban itself is no exception to this. And their views are often far more radical, though conservative, than the old-fashioned conservatives had advocated. The presence of dissenters against heavy suppression indicates that the opposition to radical conservatism need not be ruled out either by non-comprehension of rival beliefs, lifestyles, and ideas of thought, nor by rejection of those alternative ideas. Indeed, the need for policing, incarceration, and brutal punishment that are often imposed on resistors um, in all the repressive regime, and not least in Afghanistan, which I was discussing, indicates that the human mind is harder to lock up than the human body. The sense of belonging to a community, while strong enough in many cases, need not obliterate or overwhelm the, our ability to think of other associations, competing affiliations, discordant values, and very different commitments. Indeed, issues of global justice not split up into community-based ethics have become quite prominent in the context of debates, recent debates on globalization, which I critically assessed in my second lecture. The extreme nature of global inequality and the presence of extensive deprivation have received attention at different levels, including in the noisy and rowdy form of protesting demonstrations from Seattle and Melbourne and Washington to London and Prague and Quebec and Genoa. One of the first features to note about the recent demonstrations against globalization is the extent to which these protests are themselves very globalized events. To see them as anti-globalization protests can be, in this sense, very misleading. The voice global discontent and disaff disaffection and draw on people from very many different countries and very distinct regions of the world. The protesters are not local boys of Seattle or Genoa. And many of their values relate to global issues of inequality and disparity and the demands of global ethics. The concerns of the demonstrators are often reflected in roughly structured demands and crudely devised slogans. But the themes of these protests have been consistently more important, as I tried to argue in the second lecture, than their thesis. Their intent questioning has been more significant than the ready-made answers handed over in their slogans or the placards they have carried. The questions that emerge call for far-reaching institutional changes in the global economic and political arrangements, varying from revision of patent laws and reciprocity in economic relations to the broadening of the institutional architecture we have inherited from the early efforts of Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. These changes can actually involve greater 
rather than less globalized interactions and cohesions. It is particularly important to see that the sense of identity which finds expression in these movements and also in many other expressions of global concern, such as the environmental agitation, which are so extensive now, goes well beyond national identities. I don't think these movements, the environmental or the anti-globalization movement in their globalized form, do get enough credit for taking a view of identity, which is, I mean, is a, is a non-divisive identity about humanity as a whole. Identity choice has a strong bearing on global justice. Recognizing the possibility of identity choice has the immediate implication that global justice must be seen to be a much larger idea than international justice with which it is often confused. And this I discussed yesterday in the fifth lecture. To see global justice as international justice is to assume that the national identity of a person must somehow be our predominant identity, our first call. But people in different parts of the world interact with each other in many different ways, through commerce, through science, through literature, through music, through medicine, through political agitation, and also institutionally through global NGOs, the news media, and so on. Their relations are not all mediated through governments or representatives of nations or states. For example, a French doctor who wants to work toward remedying some illnesses in, say, Haiti or Congo, if you consider her, her commitment draws on a sense of identity that does not operate through the sympathies of one nation for the predicament of another. I discussed that example in the context of Earth and American feminists yesterday. It's, 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 it's a similar point that's being made here. Her identity, in this case, as a fellow human being, or her sense of duty based on her identity as a doctor, may be more important here than her citizenship. Indeed, many NGOs, Médecins Sans Frontières, as the name itself indicates, Oxfam, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and others, explicitly focus on affiliations and associations that cut, cut right across national boundaries. The national identity, as I discussed in, in, in yesterday's lecture, lecture in greater detail, does not have any preeminent precedence over other senses of belonging. And this applies to every other system of partitioning people, since our diverse diversities is one of the major characteristics of humanity. I should perhaps try at this last part of the lecture now to bring uh, this discussion to a close with some concluding remarks trying to weave together some of the themes I've been discussing. In these six lectures, I've tried to cover such a wide range of issues which are interlinked but nevertheless distinct that it would be quite hopeless to attempt to capture, as it were, the quote-unquote main points. But without aiming at anything like, like such pervasive coverage, and there will be many issues discussed which I will not get back to now, obviously, I may still try to choose a few points for a particular focus as a kind of parting effort in this final occasion. First, we belong to very many different groups and we have to choose our priorities between them. This is, as it were, the recurrent theme of these lectures. Even though the allegedly, allegedly irresistible demands of parochial identity of a sect or community or a nation or a culture or civilization may be invoked to build us, to, may be invoked to bully us into submission, we have to resist smallness being thrust upon us. The record of bloody confrontation, whether in Rwanda or Yugoslavia, or in Sudan and Sri Lanka, or in Ireland and Indonesia, indicates how much difference the right to our identity and our reflective freedom to choose can actually make. Second, 
Given the diversity of our identities, some of the celebrated social virtues have to be re-examined in the light of consequences that go in contrary directions. And this applies even to some of the most constructive and creative, and in my judgment, most important of recent contributions to, to social discussion. For example, the positive achievement of the idea of social capital, which I discussed yesterday, and uh, as I mentioned, initially suggested by Glenn Lowry and very extensively discussed by Robert Putnam and others, which has enriched our social uh, discussion and understanding greatly. Nevertheless, the idea can be also associated with negative predispositions in relations between communities, even as it, as it solidifies relations within it. And the constructive contributions of multiculturalism, to take another example, with a focus on local communities, can also be restrictive in keeping out our involvement with our global heritage and the breadth of human history and illumination. I discussed these things with examples yesterday. Even the great achievements of nation-based theories of justice, including the grandest of them all, the most profoundly important theory of justice of John Rawls, which is, has to focus institutionally on a polity, their reach have to be qualified by noting their difficulty in escaping what I called in the fifth lecture last yesterday, procedural parochialism and arbitrary exclusion, even when you consider extensions like Rawls considers in the law of peoples. Third, we must distinguish between the first person and the third person perspective in identity. I discussed this, I think, in one of the early lectures. The victimization of a group related to race, gender, class, or caste is largely a matter of third person perspective in identity and identification. Indeed, the third person perspectives on class or race or gender related to one's identification by others can work in very different ways from the first person perspective related to one's own sense of belonging and affiliation. The former, that is the third person perspective, is especially important for public portrayal and depiction and related to it the operation of group-based discrimination, such as ra race or gender. The third person understanding is also deeply influenced by the availability of information about the respective groups, and even about what economists tend to call asymmetric information. Even though we know well enough that a person is a distinct individual, and in many ways clearly unique, we also tend to think of persons as members of particular groups, especially when we know very little about the person. In the external perception, this is not only the foundation of racist, sexist, and other sectarian prejudices, but also frequently the epistemic basis, basis of our views, right or wrong, or what to expect of someone we do not actually know very well. For example, when a group is disadvantaged in terms of, say, education, the identity of a person seen just as a member of that group, which may be the only immediately visible characteristic, and race and gender are often the most visible features of a half-known person, can lead to a reasoned evaluation, and I emphasize reason, based on subjective expectation, Bayesian probabilities, that may be simultaneously morally repellent and contingently cognitive. The inseparable linkage of epistemic role of classification with its nasty and unacceptable discriminatory consequences is a subject of great analytical interest as well as of practical relevance, including in understanding why is it in some circumstances affirmative action may have a counteracting but constructive part to play. 
The evil of racism or sexism can, it be, can be inadvertently but effectively watered by the rational epistemology of group-based information. Fourth, identities based on communities on which communitarians concentrate may or may not be important for us. It depends on our valuation, and it is for us to decide what importance to attach to them. That choice cannot be taken away from us on the basis of some barrier of inscrutability or some unreasoned belief in a predetermined priority or even more, myster even more mysteriously in some fate on the great power of discovery. To deny choice where choice exists is to deny human responsibility on which our future largely depends. Fifth, the world is not just a collection of nations, but also of persons. The relation between one human being and another need not be mediated by the relation of one nation to another, a point I've just discussed. This can be, very important, can be a very important recognition in the precarious and insecure world in which we live. It can make, for example, a big difference, the fact that we need not speak to the state, but as human being to another, could make a big difference, for example, in Palestine and Israel, in the United States and Iraq, in India and Pakistan, with or without the darkening shadow of missiles and nuclear bombs. Sixth, nor can the people of the world be partitioned into civilizations, as if the civilizations are distinct entities and as if our membership of a particular civilization must be our only identity or a predominant one. The weakness, I have argued, of the thesis of clash of civilizations begins well before the expectation of a clash is inserted into the more basic idea of a preeminent civilizational partitioning, where, in my judgment, the main breach actually occurs. The hope of peace in the world does not, I have tried to argue, lie in the grand fiction of a manifest uni unity or uniformity of all human beings, that we are all much the same, but in our diverse diversities that we differ, but differ in very many different ways so that the people are not lined against each other on a dividing, crusading line. Seventh, there is much evidence that communication even across the boundaries of culture, country, or civilization, can be far less challenging than mechanical theories of non-comprehension tend to claim and could be far more productive than is often allowed. The fact that we can talk to each other despite the divisions in the world has been asserted and celebrated over thousands of years, and it is no less important today, indeed perhaps more important today than ever before. Intelligibility has to be contrasted with agreement, and even the existence of initial doubts have to be distinguished from perpetual disagreement or strife. Eight, our identities cannot but be interactive, both within the same categories, such as different national or cultural groupings, or between them, such as cultural categories as distinguished from political or professional ones. One of the reasons for tension in the world lies in the dominance in the contemporary world of the West in the way power and economic success are currently divided in the globe. The chauvinism of the West that results from it can in fact lead to the denial of a world heritage of science of mathematics, engineering, and literature that make Western civilization look like an immaculate conception without acknowledging the extent to which contributions in the non-Western world have been historically absorbed in the construction of the modern Western civilization. I gave many examples of that, of the role of Chinese science and engineering, of Arabic and Indian mathematics, of African in civilizational initiations and so on, which have a part and parcel of what we now call 
Western civilizations. Um, oddly enough, I was uh, recollecting in a talk I gave in New York that um, uh, I think it's Thomas Carlyle who discusses Western civilization having three uh, clearly defined most important things, Protestant ethics, printing, and gunpowder. Now, China, the Chinese could not be blamed for the Protestant ethics, but uh, certainly the, the, the mixing of civilizations is well illustrated by this example itself, which actually, by the way, draws on an earlier passage by Francis Bacon. The partly, um, uh, partly as a reaction to this, the non-Western world often tends to deny its links and commonalities with West, trying to see itself as, quote, unquote, the other in contrast with the West, beautifully discussed by my friend Akhil Bilgrami, uh, a, Columbia, a Columbia University philosopher, as to why we have seized in the non-Western world, he's speaking there as a as an Indian and as a Muslim, in both contexts, as the other rather than ourselves. The reach of that negativity can be seen in such variety of forms as the championing of Asian values and the celebration of non-Christian theology. The question has to be very sharply asked as to why it is that, say, an Arab nationalist today would tend to focus more on religious differences and theological um, contrast rather than the Arab world's long heritage of mathematics, science, and of political tolerance, which contributed greatly, as I discussed in a previous lecture, to what are now called Western science or to Western values. We need to probe more deeply into the way identity is constructed and our interactive, in our uh, interactive and dialectical world. Finally, international justice, as I emphasized just now also, cannot exhaust the claims of global justice. Our global interrelations can be far more extensive than international interactions. And even anti-globalization protests cannot escape being global events questions of equity, concern, and responsibility have to be adequately addressed in a broad enough perspective. To conclude, the implications of the plurality of identities and the role of social reasoning and choice are thus immensely far-reaching. They have a direct bearing on a variety of critically important issues, some of which I try to recollect in this lecture, but there are others which are considered earlier. The future of the world will depend on our ability to see these momentous issues with clarity and with engagement. Indeed, the future of the world is not entirely distinguishable in this sense from the future of our identity. This is where the grand problem, the grand problems of the contemporary world lie, but happily, so do the solutions that we have to seek. Demand may not invariably create a supply, but it is not a bad, bad place to start. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Sen will now take questions. And would you please wait for someone to come with a microphone uh, before asking your questions so we can all hear? I'd like to focus, uh, first let me apologize, I have missed several of your lectures because I was not in the country, so you may have covered it. You're forgiven. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to focus uh, a little bit more on the transition from uh, plurality of identities, which we all have 
uh, if you see it in a space-time phenomena in different countries and different religious groups or whatever, to this uh, single or maybe a few dimensions of identity which societies go through at certain critical points. And uh, my point is, what is the process? It may be it's brokered by or midwifed by power brokers or identity politics or whatever, negative forces. But is there something primordial in people in which some identity is there to be tapped into, whether it's religious or ling linguistics yeah. or, or whatever? And if so, how can we understand that transition process in such a way or transformation that we can intervene at an early enough time yes. to abort it? Yeah. No, I'm um, very glad you asked that question because it's very central to what I'm concerned with. First, two clarificatory points and then uh, substantive issues at the end. My point isn't so much that with space and time, our identity is very. At a point of time, one individual has a great many identities. OK? I'm an economist. I'm at the moment wearing a Western dress. I've been seen to wear um, Indian dress at other times. Um, um, I have many other identities, left of center, um, um, greatly in sympathy with uh, many libertarian causes, uh, and so forth. All these are part of my identity. And depending on the context, they are sometimes very important. I mean, if I'm going to a dinner, whether or not I'm a vegetarian is a very important part of my identity. Though if I'm going to a political lecture, it may not be very important in that context. So it depends. But the, it's it, that in the location of an individual, there's a variety of things. And yesterday's lecture, I discuss also, I'm often accused of being an individualist, and in some ways I am. It's because I don't see how an individual could be absorbed into just one group, because we belong to so many different groups. There's absolutely no way that my identity as an individual can go away as being just this or just that, because there's so many different things. And depending on the context, I will enter in one, one social context or another. Actually, I quoted Karl Marx on that subject, too, because it was on a very clear passage, 1875. Now, the, that's the first point. The second point is that, depending on the context, we emphasize some identity. And when there is a conflict, we have to decide what importance to attach. Like Gora, as an example I gave, a Jewish person today may have to choose, uh, think about how important to give the Jewish identity, also as a sympathizer of Israel to Israeli identity, what view to take about Israeli policy, what view to take as the identity as a human being, and if one feels that the Palestinians are being treated extremely badly, uh, then what view to take of that if one reacts to the terrorism that Hamas may be doing on Israelis that would generate other kinds of identity sympathy for victims of terrorism, which is not just Israeli victims, but victims anyway. So all kinds of ways a person can decide on this by taking into account all these considerations. So it's a question of weighing and balancing. Now, what my concern has been in, with respect to the particular issue that you're raising is that if there's confusion on that, and so much of the literature is full of confusions here, that it's a very easy prey for someone to say, look, you are just this. I mean, I was, I mean I've seen his rhetoric, unfortunately, having lived through the bloody 1940s to which I referred. And I discussed one or two cases of my experience in the Hindu-Muslim riots, uh, seeing the first person being I saw ever murdered a Muslim daily laborer just outside my home. And the conversation was, I was 11, I think then, uh, was very instructive to me. And you can see how people feed on that. You say that, you know, you, you're a Hindu or you're a Muslim. Uh, the other side are killing us. Um, you have to retaliate. Uh, you know, we are being killed in numbers. And you hear that. I mean, even David yesterday in BBC interview in Gujarat, people repeated that. We have taken it lying down, no longer we are going to show them that Hindus stand up for themselves. So what happens is that you invoke 
an identity which had undoubtedly exists, that you may be Hindu or a Muslim. But rather than saying, well, how would you, how that, does it relate to other identities you may have as a human being or someone who doesn't want to kill other people, or whatever it is, that identity that you may have, instead of asking the question, you do a short circuit just to say, this is your duty. And that's what I was referring to, that what is a half-analyzed invocation to violence is placed as a call to duty related to your identity. And here I feel, even though I'm very upset whenever there's administrative failure, and as an Indian, of course, I'm very upset by the state of Gujarat's total inability to handle what was a, clearly a law and order issue. Nevertheless, I also would argue, in top of that, that there is a deep intellectual problem. There is an intellectual engagement to be made, which is not, in the Indian context, just an assertion of secularism, which is, of course, important, but also to go at the root of why is it that identities remain such flammable concepts. It may be uh, Hindu rioters in one case, or the Muslim terrorists in other cases, or some other group, or Hutus killing Tutsis in other cases. It remains a very flammable um, area uh, in, 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 in human decisional process. And I think we need great clarity to be able to resist it, because I'm, you know, I'm a um, great believer in enlightenment. And of course, somebody would immediately say, this is the in European influence, because European enlightenment is so well understood. And that's true. I remind people that the name of Buddha was the enlightened one, so it's not an unknown concept in other cultures as well. <laughs> so I do take um, um, great pride in the belief that human beings can re react to and learn from from reflection and analysis and knowledge. And I think that's where the response is in order to your answer to your question. So I would say, substantively, what happens is that there's a battle. Some people who, would, who have a political purpose, uh, I mean, in case of India, I have a very particular way of explaining it, namely that uh, at this time that the BJP, which is a Hindu dominant party, which had great many states, in, in control, it, it happened to have a central government in coalition, but nearly every state that have come up for election um, since their big victory in, in, in 98, they have lost. Gujarat is one of the few ones left, and in some ways the political pressure is intense to raise the Hindu agenda again. And suddenly this identity question comes in because the number of people who can be moved by that may be very tiny. But um, these are Hindu activists of that persuasion. But then the description, if you read the newspaper, you would say Hindus are killing Muslims, the Muslims are killing Hindus. Suddenly at one stroke of pen, the identity, a small group of, um, uh, of um, activists will be a good way of describing it, of, of, of terrorists, of murderers, of genociders, is made into, given to a whole community of people. And then that is very easy to explain. Ex exploit. Similarly, the Muslims would say, many Muslims have been killed, time for us to rise. So clarity, in my judgment, is very central. That's what these lectures have been about. And I've, in answer to your question, the, what brings about the transgressions are the the lack of clarity. And I think the solution lies also in greater clarity. This is a very, you might say, a very academic position to take, and perhaps it is, but that is my position. So I'm very grateful you asked that question. I think back in your second lecture you talked about agency. And yes. Uh, I, I think that uh, I, I've been trying to think about the relationship of agency to identity, and I, I come with, to the question of is, is, can you do a cost-benefit analysis, maybe, of the role of uh, identity in individual agency? Can you see the pluses and minuses of the various identities 
in the development of uh, effective activity? Yes, I think you can. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, but it's, it's a, uh, you know, like your question yesterday, it's a profoundly important and difficult question. I, I welcome difficult question, even when I can't answer it because I like to think about it. So let me first of all thank you for that. But then go on to say there are two things I would like to say here. One is age, being an agent is itself an identity of some kind. Uh, in the context of, in the, context of, the, of the, the discussion yesterday, um, uh, dealing with the environment, I distinguish between the, uh, the, the medieval distinction between the agent and the patient. And I argued that even though the Brundtland and Solo's very good discussion about sustainable development is uh, very, uh, has made major contributions. I mean, I was taking up issues which I greatly admire, like. Uh, uh, like Rawls' theory of justice, idea of social capital, or envi um, environmental sustainability, but then also critiquing it. But even though it's done that, the trouble really is that the framework is always maintaining the living standards of, of, of people. Now, that means animals and the preservation of species that it comes in, comes in only in so far as it affects my living standard. Now, if I'm an agent rather than a patient, I could decide that, look, it doesn't affect my living standard, but it's a crying shame if the species go out. And if somebody said, would your life be reduced? No, my life wouldn't be reduced, but as an agent, I think. I mean, my life wouldn't be reduced as a patient, but as an agent, I think I ought to do it. So being an agent is itself an identity, which is extremely important. So that's my first point to make. Secondly, I think the question of agency becomes, it's really present in many different ways in all the things I've been discussing. Just to give an example, take the issue of the other, Akhil Delgami point that I was discussing. Now, what's wrong with defining your identity in terms of a contrast with somebody else? I'm not that, I'm not a Westerner, I'm not this, I'm not this, etc. Um, well, I think the main thing is that it, it, it basically is a denial of your agency. You're reactive. You're just, you know, you're just being determined by some other people. You don't have the independent agency to stand. Here I stand. This is what I want to do. I think it's that which is extremely important. So I'm very glad you brought me back to agency because it figured, as you said, in earlier lectures a bit. And it's a very central concept to, to things. And when I do the book, which I will someday, um, I'm very slow usually, but uh, I will, uh, you'll see more, more on this, and I'll be grateful to you. You made a reference to Gujarat, the events in Gujarat. Like what happened in Gujarat, earlier it was Mumbai, now it is Gujarat. Like they are, these are two of the most developed states of India. And like the, what is happening there, could you explain how these could be prevented or how the underlying issues which lead to them can be solved? Or there could be some better way of uh, manifestation of emotions than what is happening there? Yes, yeah. well, I think there are different things to look at here. Um, I think that these movements, of course, have been very deeply political. Uh, where the politics is different, you don't see that. I mean, nearly all states of India, I mean, of the dreadful thing I was discussing, 1940s, affected all India. But that's not true of the present round. It's confined to what I would say is about tenth of the country, even though sometimes in the news reporting one would not get that picture. And it is states in which um, Hindu politics has been extremely strong. Um, it has other associative features with it, some of which have not been, I think some of which I don't even understand, though I note them. I did a paper, I think it came out in New Republic and in a longer form in Frontline, that there are peculiar demographic connections also with that, but I don't fully understand. And for example, one of the peculiar things is, I don't really understand why that happened, 
But the if, if one, does, one subject, which I haven't discussed here because I didn't have time, gender. Um, uh, I did discuss in the third lecture a bit, or fourth lecture a bit, but gender is one of the subjects I worked on. And one of the things that's happening in India is a move away from discrimination against young girls after they're born. You see that almost disappearing, uh, much reduced. But discrimination before birth, natality discrimination, sex-selective abortion, has become quite strong. The roughly more boys and, are born than girls. So if you're looking at the population of children, one to five, one to six, you'll find about 95 girls for 100 boys anywhere in Europe and America. And India had about 95 also, despite the discrimination against boys, against girls, it did not come out very strongly. You still have, in the, even in the 1991 census, it was 95. But now fallen suddenly to 93.7. But that's an overall picture, big change. But then, if you look at the pattern, it's extraordinary that in North and West, the uh, ratios have fallen dramatically from 95. It's come down to 85, 82, 83. In fact, Gujarat, um, Punjab, uh, Haryana, they all fall in that category of, of low to middle 80s. Whereas all the eastern states, all the southern states, still have European ratios. It's true of Assam, it's true of Bengal, it's true of Orissa, it's true of Kerala. Kerala is often an exception, but it's not an exception in this case. Andhra Pradesh is much the same, and so on. So you have a pattern which seems to split the country. The point that I made is that if you looked at the, the political division, very heavy proportion of the BJP MPs come from West and the North. Now, I'm not attributing a cause and effect in either direction, but there has to be some kind of a cultural distinction which is associated with both these features. What is it? I don't know. I would like to know. And it's not the traditional features that Indian cultural anthropologists have tended to discuss. That is, if you look at the great works of, say, Iravati, Karve, and so on, these are divisions between north and south. That's not the division here. The east-south, east-west division is, in fact, much sharper, because in the east and southern bloc, one is a mild exception, still higher girl ratio than any Western or, uh, or, 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 or northern state is Tamil Nadu, but marginally lower than in Europe. All the others are either European ratio or higher. And so I think there's a thing that I don't understand. So on the cultural features, why is it that riots of this kind have not occurred in, in say, my state in Bengal uh, for 50 years? And why is it that it continues to occur in some states, which includes um, the north, and as it happened, the north and the western uh, states in India? Uh, you know, why it happened in UP, why it happened in Gujarat, and so on, remains to be explained. It's, a, it's an issue that I don't understand the cultural side. The political side, I, which are more immediate and not profound, not deep, is that BJP politics certainly has something to do with it. The Vishwa Hindu Parishad activism has something to do with the persistence of, the, um, uh, of this Hindu-Muslim question. And wherever you find, I mean, West Bengal hardly ever elects a BJP um, member of parliament and hardly ever even a member of the state assembly. And you don't see that. So, but that would be an immediate answer that it's being politically manipulated and the mechanism of manipulation is the one which I was just now discussing, exploiting the lack of clarity. On the other hand, that's not a deep enough explanation because one has to ask why is BJP so much more powerful in these one part of the country and not, not the other part of the country. I don't fully know the answer, but it's, it's that direction. If one, there, has to, there has to be some cultural depth to the analysis, which I cannot provide at this moment, because I have not done the work, and I believe I've not read anything which gives me a satisfactory answer on that. Thank you, Dr. Sen, for your informative lecture and thought-provoking thoughts. Anna? 
Thank you for your thought-provoking thoughts. Uh, follow up on your last uh, answer. What is the underlying reasoning that moves mostly a general moderate population to stick to a furious movement at a particular moment and attach an identity from time to time, which they would not otherwise in general part of their lives? Like currently, situations that happen from time to time in different parts of the world, most of the population knowingly that it's wrong, but they still go along with the movement at that particular moment and start attaching their emotions and their heart and justify it, especially the educated and the intellectual ones. Why, why do you think is that? I don't know. Again, it's another question. It's a, it's a deeply psychological Thanks. question. Why is it that we remain, even when in our normal, you know, in our standard moment, uh, certainly in our reflective moment, we are quite robust in this respect? Why is it that we remain exploitable, uh, and especially in a more moment of tension. You know, waving the bloody shirt, of course, has been used with a certain amount of force in this country in many contexts, and, and actually a rousing passion based on that. So it exists. You know, I, if I were, you know, sometimes I'm criticized as an economist. I don't seem to lecture on economics often and lecture on other subjects. Sometimes I lecture on economics, I might say. But, um, I, but you know, I take on sort of social and cultural and so on. But then that's a deep psychological question. I'd like to know the answer. To, I don't really know. Um, and I think I was asked the question yesterday also whether identity, whether the craving for identity, I think uh, uh, I was asked that, whether that's the basic thing in human being. I don't really know, but I would like to know. And if you have an answer to that, I'd like to hear it from you. <laughs> Hi. Um, how do you see the role, importance, or powers of nation states changing as maybe its citizens don't necessarily put their nationality as their most important identity and maybe associate themselves more with being a doctor or something else? Do you think that... How the power of the nation states are changing just, as a result? Or right, or just will Pardon? nation states be necessary anymore even? No, I think sort of nation culture? states... You know, I think... I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because... There is a great danger of um, taking um, a kind of um, too, um, uh, a kind of unitarian view on both sides. I don't mean in the Christian sense, unity-based view. That is, there is a kind of debate which has gone on. Do we need the nation state? No, we want go global government. And then you can give all kinds of arguments that global government would be good, there would be global justice, would be easier to pursue. And then that sort of, once that is excessive, then somebody says, but can you have global government now? Uh, you know, it's so far. I mean, the, the countries are so different, uh, they're, and they're not going to share with each other their wealth, and, and some of them will be suspicious that dreadful customs from other countries will come into your own. How can you avoid that? And therefore, global government becomes unimportant. Now, having contrasted national government with global government, that looks end of the debate. Then you go back to the national government. But what I'm not trying to argue that that's not the debate at all. Because national governments are not the only entity that exist. First of all, institutionally, there are a great many other institutions. There's the media, there's the NGOs. Even, and they don't have to be just the United Nations, but that exists too. But there's a whole lot of ways in which our lives interact with each other. If that is taken into account, what we are looking at, and your question is just right, that to what extent the, the enormous power of national governments may be reduced, constrained, qualified by these countervailing powers. One of the great concepts that that Ken Galvate uh, developed was the idea of countervailing powers. That you know, when there is a there's a one form of let's say inequality, one form of extreme power by some but not by others, the way to handle it often is not um, try to eradicate it, but it would be impossible. I mean, if you have inequality in property ownership, to say let us abolish private property, it had appeal to many people, like uh, Saint-Simon or Proudhon, but it hasn't 
been a feasible alternative to pursue. But the, the Galvatian argument is that the way to counteract is other kinds of divisions, you know, that somebody may not have the property but maybe have a tremendous newspaper voice to whom, whose articles everybody listens to, who can denounce someone and who can be very powerful. And the more these countervailing powers come in, the impact is to reduce the force of any one of them. Now, that's the way, I think, to look at the national government. I think the national government, they have a role, of course, I'm not critical of national government in general, but they also have restrictive uh, functions in the world. And the way to handle it is the, through these other, the strengthening the other ways in, human, in which human beings relate to each other. And in a general sense, that's what I'm saying about identities. When I uh, made the point, I think I quoted today, and I developed an earlier lecture, that the future, the main hope of peace in the world does not lie in our, any kind of imagined uniformity, but in our diverse diversities. It's primarily because these different diversities act as countervailing forces against each other's tyranny. That, that's the that's very central part of my strategy, and it applies in particular to the issue of national government, which you also raised. Professor Sen, I'm interested. I think interest you need a microphone. Oh, you've got one. Yes, okay. I've got one. Yeah. I'm interested in hearing how you make the connection between the idea of identity as you have been developing it with the notion of capability approach and functionings that you have worked so much in other writings. I thought that you would bring up those two uh, notions. Thank you. Well, the great expert, Sabina Alkaya, on, on capability, whose book is coming out on that, is, is here. Um, but I won't pass on the microphone to her because she hadn't been given a notice on that. Um, but the, um, I think for those who don't know what the reference is that uh, in the context of theory of justice, I have tried to argue that um, in dealing with inequality, uh, where Rawls uses primary goods, which is a resource-based view of your advantage, uh, there may be a case for looking at people's substantive freedoms. Uh, and that substantive freedom could be judged in terms of what we are capable of doing and being. And that depends on resources, including primary goods, but it also depends on many other things. It depends on whether we have genetically prone diseases, whether we are born intelligent or less intelligent, or whether we are born um, uh, crippled in one way or disabled in some way or not. So all kinds of ways we differ from each other. So if you want equality, then you have to compensate for these by uh, acting in the opposite direction. Now, I think the idea of identity doesn't immediately belong to the same plane of discourse here, because that is a, the capability is an informational contribution, insofar as it is a contribution, to how to judge the advantages that people have compared with each other. It's a statement about inequality, and it's a statement about the informational basis of a theory of justice. Identity isn't really like that. It's the way how we see ourselves, how others see us, how we interact with each other, and what kind of things we respond to, like the question that was asked, why do we remain so vulnerable to um, uh, the question that was asked just now, we are vulnerable to, to manipulation. So in a sense, they're dealing with um, two different areas of discourse. But the connection perhaps would be that insofar as we are looking at a person's freedom, right to one's identity could be quite an important thing too. That is when I could take the view that if I'm not allowed the opportunity to reason because of a kind of imposed identity on me, there is a big bandwagon going around which does not give me time to reflect whether I want to behave like a fierce Hindu or a fierce Muslim in a riot, but actually be absorbed in that. But the harm that I'm doing is not only in the violence that I might perpetrate under that influence, but also the loss 
of identity and of agency, which came up in, in the earlier question, that are independent agency that I lose. Because, and this I do discuss, our agencies are among the capabilities that we may actually value greatly. So uh, there is a connection there, but I would not really make one central to the other. There is a kind of overlap a little bit, but basically they're concerned with two rather different problems. One as ethics and in the informational basis of justice, and the other as a kind of theory of action and theory of self-understanding and understanding of others. As you can see, I'm hogging the time for making up for my absence in the past. I have two. One is a kind of clarificatory comment to see how you will react to that. And second is a process type of question. Uh, the comment is, you mentioned uh, the, the division or sort of the Northwest India versus the East. And I've been in India was, and was there, there during the Troubles. And I've been reading uh, Arun Shauri and uh, Taligeri and Lal and all of these people from Voice of India types, not because I agree with them, but I want to see where they're coming from. And one thing I see common to the several books I've read is their harping on memory. And they keep talking about what Mahmud Ghazni did and Ghori did and Aurangzeb did and what have you. And that's what I meant in terms of identity over time that you, know, you see, we saw that in, in Kosovo, we saw that in Serbia, we're seeing that in Palestine, that always somehow we have an identity with our ancestors whom we didn't know maybe three, four hundred years ago, whereas we forget the identity with our neighbors whom we do know. And I'm wondering yeah, to that, what yeah. extent mm. that this kind of division between Northwest India and Southeast, is this, they suffered more, enslavement more or whatever, at least these folks are saying, and we know that for Trump, because they were closer to the centers from where the invasions came in. Do you think that that could be playing a part in this? I, I doubt it, because uh, you know, if you take Bengal, for example, I mean, that is the undivided Bengal was two-third Muslim, one-third Hindu. And so I don't think the Islamic presence was any less in Bengal than it was in Gujarat, if the riots haven't occurred in West Bengal. It isn't because of that. And indeed, from the decline of the, um, and the Hindu and the Buddhist kingdoms in the 12th century, Bengal, uh, virtually all Bengali kings have been Muslim kings. So I don't think that's a point of distinction. Now, I think the phenomenon is much more modern than that, than in history. But your first point was absolutely right. The memory is played, but it's not often long-term memory. Uh, you know, if you, if you have some killing that occurs, uh, then you always remember. Don't you remember how Muslims kill, kill Hindus? Uh, if you're a Hindu, that would be the kind of, uh, if you're an activist Hindu trying to incite violence, that would be the kind of phraseology we will use. Now, there are several different things here. First of all, you're looking at memory, which is the point you're making. Secondly, you're looking also at a classification whereby you remember that some Muslims had killed some Hindus, but they're you know, maybe separated by, by time and, and by many other ways. And as I discussed in my, one of my lectures, I think in the, third, in the fourth lecture, that the Hindus and Muslims, that they were killed in the, in the riots that I saw in Dhaka, for example, in the 40s. If you look at the Hindu-Muslim identities, they were very different identities. But if you look at their class identities, they were all the bottom layer, virtually all bottom layer of the poor sections. They were working classes who had to go out, despite riots, who had to go out to work, to earn a living, who live in slums which could be, put, could be set ablaze, who have to seek a wage and offer them a little money, they will come out. The person whom I saw murdered, a Muslim laborer, had come into this largely Hindu area because he was offered he had an offer, genuine offer a job. He was on his way there. There was no, not much to eat at home. He had to go out. A rich person would not have to, to go out. So while the identities of the victims were very divided between Hindus and Muslims, identities as the poor who, have to, who live in slums, have to go out for work, were much the same. The common, 
but is the commonality of that class identity which was suppressed in favor of the diversity of the religious identity. And that's, of course, part of the politics that's being played. And in the context of the, I mean, if you look, I mean, Bengal is interesting to look at because Bengal had very bad riots that I was discussing in 1940s, but the fact that neither Bangladesh nor, in, uh, nor West Bengal in India has had riots since the, over the last 50 years indicate that there was, in fact, a lot of political effort in that direction, both in the Bangladesh side, in terms of partly Bengali nationalist politics and separatism movement, and in the West Bengal, partly the rhetoric of the left, which played up the common class identity a great deal in contradistinction to the divisive religious identity. I would look at that rather than the 300 year or 400 year or 600 year whole history. I don't think you could distinguish between them in that form. Kerala, by the way, which has never had any riot, has the earliest presence of Muslims in India by a long margin. It began in the 7th, 8th century, Arab traders trade settling in, and has, with the exception of Kashmir, it is one of the highest Muslim proportion states in India. Never had any riots, not even in the 1940s. I've noticed how identity um, seems as much. Uh, you noticed what? I, I've noticed um, identity um, seems like it's as much personal as political in the sense that it, it seems like, uh, in part, uh, just simply about feeling good about about oneself. Like I've seen the button "kiss me, I'm Slovenian." You know that sort of you know ethnic pride. Um, but um, my question is um, uh, to inquire about the intellectual genealogy of identity, um, tracing back to like Erickson, maybe even to mathematics, and whether um, I, the identity inscribes uh, older notions like um, the Christian soul, the essence of one's being. Well, in one form or other, identity has occurred in uh, discussion of identity has occurred in almost every cultural tradition. And you refer to Christian souls, almost all the religious discussions too. Um, the, uh, the discussion in the, in the Indian context of, say, Atman, which is a concept of the self, is often defined in terms of groups to which you belong. Not always. Sometimes the point is made that that's not what you are. You are actually an individual, a separate entity. Similarly, Buddha discusses quite extensively the issue of identity as well. So that it has figured a long time. I'm not enough, I mean, all my failings have come out. I'm not all, enough of a psychologist to be able to answer some question that was asked earlier. I'm not, I'm not enough of a historian of religion to be able to give an adequate answer to this question. But they're very old in, I mean, in bits that I have read. They have figured. Um, very extensively, actually. So I wouldn't think uh, there's no danger of its thinking as a modern invention. But its use is, is very strong in that form. And you see, so you see the invocation of that. I mean, I was referring, for example, I read um, Al Biruni more than a thousand years ago when talking about how, as a group, we Iranians as he was describing, are suspicious of Indians, and Indians are suspicious of us. And this is the kind of suspicion that we all have of each other. Now, there's a very strong concept of identifying people according to these categories in that. And of course, he's saying that's a mistake. And we could avoid that by knowing more about each other, which would contribute to kill some of the prejudices we have. It's a very old problem. That's all I can say here. Thank you, Dr. Sen. Um, a, a few points I'd like to bring together to ask my question, um, and it's mostly directed toward paving, um, paving the way forward in a very troubled world as we see it. And you've referred to this um, with uh, talk of conflict and uh, the things we seem to be imposing on each other. When I think of 
periods in which mankind seems to have advanced uh, most significantly, um, immediately what comes to mind are the heyday of the different religious systems that we've had. Uh, Israel in the early times after when Moses came, the Christian states, um, the Islamic states. Um, I don't know where the great rise of China comes into it, but those, those are the periods that come immediately to mind. And that is when you would associate people having a common identity that was so great to them that it overcame their other identities. Um, now that speaks of a unity of identity which you say... You're, you're saying that. Th that is my observation. Yes. At right. the same time, I, I grew up in Kenya, which is very close to Rwanda, and I often heard it commented that the reason Kenya never went into civil war was that there were so many identities that no one identity ever had the opportunity to fight Wonderful. the other. Uh, you have uh, uh, exactly what I was going to say. So I'm glad that you posed the question and answered it. <laughs> um, I, sadly, I don't really agree with the second, the second half of what I said. Oh, really? Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you are right, you know, in the second half. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder whether what the world really needs is a state of a common identity. Um, you know, when I'm speaking of identity now, I'm not talking of an intellectual identity, but one that is about belief, not necessarily religious, but a matter of heart and Which soul. Which one is this going to be? A difficult question. <laughs> well, we might reflect on that. Um, I find the idea of Thanks. looking for a single identity uh, quite unnerving, because uh, even though it appeals, and people you know, often say that can't we see ourselves as just human beings, uh, and there's merit in that, but uh, you know we know that that answer is not adequate in in many contexts because uh, there are there's, there are many respects in which we are different and which makes a big difference in dealing with um, particular issues, what kind of literature we read, what kind of way we amuse ourselves, and so forth. So we do uh, see our distinctions, and yet, if you were to say that we need some kind of a common understanding, which um, is an overarching um, demand of civilized behavior, I would have much less problem. But I won't call the demand of civilized behavior towards each other, despite differences, to be a unified identity. That's not what it is working there. In fact, it has to be aware of the diversity of identities. And the reason why your Kenyan friend might have been right is that there are many other examples of that too. And you know, in a sense, oddly enough, that the, the, um, even in the context of India, it's only when, if, if you look at the, India is divided into all kinds of different language groups, are extremely divided. Uh, uh, you know, there are, uh, whatever it is, 16 or 15 major languages, each spoken by 50 million or so people. Uh, then there are culturally big differences, etc. And as long as religion was just one of them, there was really a great opportunity of unity there. And indeed, in many ways, the rhetoric of Gandhi or Tagore just emphasized that very much. And in a sense, the new extremism of Hindu politics in India is a denial of that thing. This is not like that. The distinction between Bengali literature and Hindi literature is minor. The distinction between Hindu and Muslim, my God, that's very big. It's the attempt to privilege one, kick all the others, which produces that. So I think this quest for a single identity is, um, is in my judgment, uh, uh, dangerous and, and, and full of difficult potentials. And I don't even, I'm not much of a historian, but I don't even accept that as an explanation of what happened in the spread of Christian culture or, or spread of Islamic culture or what happened in the Crusades or what happened in the Chinese cases. That's a very simple way of trying to analyze history 
almost the same level of crudity as the clash of civilizations. And that's quite a bit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sain. Uh, whenever I see a cricket match between India and Pakistan, uh, I see a lot of emotional attachment of all Indians being as Indians rather than Hindus and Muslims in India. Yeah. So do you think if there is a match wherein India and Pakistan are together as one team and play against the world, is there a possibility of uh, decreasing the tension in Kashmir or things like that? <laughs> I must think about it, because <laughs> this would be not only a wonderful end result, it would be a marvelous process through which cricket would produce a solution to that. Uh, I fear I remain a bit skeptical, but I see the point that, I think the general point you're making is that depending on the context, you can suddenly find people suppressing some identities which are very divisive, say Hindu-Muslim, but happen to be an Indian, and suddenly turning very strongly patriotic uh, in, in a different way. I think the main lesson to get from it is that our identities negatively can be manipulated, but positively could be also made to react depending on the context, and I believe depending not just in participation in a game to which you're referring, but also reflection. So I think insofar as it's pointing out the, that the malleability of identities is both a vulnerability, but also at the same time, it's a potential for reconstruction uh, and peace. I accept the point, though peace through cricketing matches, I'm not sure that I so easily accept. But it's a good point. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure how to put this, but one of the things that I've attended two of the lectures, um, one of the things that strikes me is uh, we were talking about identity in primarily a verbal intellectual forum. Um, and yet, from my thinking about this and from my own experience, um, a lot of construction of identity would probably need to be explored in non, in, in different forms beyond. G give me an example of what would be a non-intellectual form of expo ex uh, uh, exploration. Maybe, maybe intellectual is not quite the right word, but let's say the, right, right now we, we have no tools. Uh, everything is done in a oral fashion. Uh, we, there's no movement, there's no pictures, there's no film. Um, where, where? Right here. Oh, right here. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. true. Um, I've neglected. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm half-baked here. Um, so, so I guess I'm just throwing it out for a thing like, how much is your enterprise challenged by the fact that maybe identity can never truly be uh, understood unless it's explored in multiple uh, media in a way? But well, we are discussing the multiple media, though. It's true, I haven't got a film here. Yeah. And no dancing is going on right now. Mm -hmm. But the role that the media or culture plays is uh, very important to, to these concerns. And in fact, films actually have figured quite a bit in my, my work. I did an article on, on um, the on Ray's, uh, Satyajit Ray's uh, films. And I think I'm right in thinking my first, that was my first paper on identity. It was called, um, he, had a, he had a book called Our Film, Their Film. And this particular article uh, was called Our Culture, Their Culture. And it was also about identity. Now, there's a difference between showing, uh, between being in a film showing a film, and discussing a film. 
and its impact. I was doing the last, which I think you were describing as merely intellectual. But it is not uh, unrelated to making a film and showing it and, and seeing it. So, you know, uh, it's, in that sense, I would say that the, your point is absolutely right, that you can't capture uh, the way identity operates only in terms of words. But that's not the same thing as saying you cannot describe how cap identity is captured by non-words in words. That's what I was trying to do, like most of us do when we are lecturing on any subject. We don't usually present dancing by dancing. We discuss you know, it in terms of words as to what is so special about Nijinsky, let's say, and so forth. So that's the way I would react. Is that a, am I, uh, am I? Uh, it, it, it's still a hot take in my mind. But I guess the other thing that I'm thinking of is that um, a lot of this is about the power of choice. Yes. But choosing is also an act of courage often. Yes, oh, it certainly is. And, Approaching identity um, in, I, I, I guess, like I was reflecting, like in, in some ways it'd be interesting to approach identity in beyond the lecture. But I can imagine someone, as if I was trying to then approach this subject and I wanted to try multiple media, I would find that a very difficult decision to make because of the problems of how people will receive that. So I guess. I mean, it's just, again, I'm not sure exactly what I'm saying. It's just something that's been... No, I think it seems, I mean, uh, you must be the ultimate authority as to what you're saying. But it seems to me that you're saying that in order to understand how our identity operates, we have to take into account our multiple sensory inputs as well as the multiple media that feed those um, sensory inputs and, and how we react and how we think about it and so forth. It's not just thinking in a, in a kind of very abstract way. We see uh, pictures and visions. And the question that was raised as to why we remain so vulnerable, I mentioned the waving of the bloody shirt. Now, that's an image. That's not words. But you see somebody's bloody shirt, and you would stand up and be counted. So I think we have to talk about, I mean, I think any discussion of identity would be very poor if it did not bring in the multiplicity of the media that comes in. But that's not the same thing as having to show those things here. I mean, just to give an example, if you were to go and somebody asked you what was the lecture like and you wanted to say it's an extremely boring lecture, then in order to communicate that it was a boring lecture, all you need to do is to say that it was a boring lecture <laughs> rather than make the listener bored by repeating that point many, many times and until he said, ah, oh, yes, that's what it was like. Because we can communicate more easily than that. So that's the distinction we are playing. Uh, and we, we certainly have reason to consider multiple ways in which we think. And, and so I'm glad you raised the question, because it's a, uh, we live in a world which is very colorful, very co full of color, full of sound, full of different ways in which our senses are invaded. Uh, uh, Dr. Sen, thanks a lot for the um, for the speech. Um, is it possible? Do you think that it's analytically useful to make a distinction between identities that have more influence uh, substantively on the one hand, and those that are more influential in procedural? I would call meaning that um, some identities are actually more influential in choosing or sort of directing us on, uh, on choosing a couple or maybe one of those identities that are available out there. The direction that, I'm, that I want to go is, if one, if we accept that there is a multiplicity of identities and they work in different ways in different contexts, which is very much sort of putting everything together, um, instead of doing that, would you say that there is, I don't know, maybe a rational choice sort of identity that somehow everyone shares that it allows us to navigate through these different identities? Or would you say that 
every identity has its own procedural system of you know, hierarchies of identities. Uh, no, none of them. That uh, there exists a plurality of identities, which is not a special thing that we all happen to have many identities simultaneously. You see, I think the language has been so vulgarized now that it looks as if I'm saying something profound when I'm saying something absolutely obvious, that we have great many identities simultaneously without any contradiction. But after having crossed, you know, pushed through what should be an open door, but it looks closed because that's the way it's been constructed, the next question is, is there any canonical way of dealing with particular identity conflicts? that would apply to everyone and would make sense for everyone. No, I haven't made that claim, and I don't believe it's true. Is it the case that each identity has its own logic? I don't know, but it's nothing I say depends on it, and I don't believe it's true either. So I think it's what you, it, you know, it would be like having, I mean, an analogy would be, the, Eating does not have the same kind of implication as identity-based thought has. But in this respect, suppose there are different kinds of food that we eat. And we say, look, there are different types of food. And they say, oh, yes, so it's not one food that we eat. No, we are different kinds of food. And then he said, do you want to say that there is a kind of preferred kind of food which everyone must eat? So I said, no, it depends on your taste, and it varies a lot. And then if somebody said, do each does every item of food have a logic of its operation? I said, no, not that either. I've not noticed it. Uh, it's that kind of a subject we're looking at, that we have a multiplicity of identities. They all have some relevance. Sometimes the relevance may be very small, maybe even zero. They may, in principle, conflict with each other. Very often they don't. When they do conflict with each other, we may have to decide. When, and this is like saying when we are getting full, we may have to decide that whether we do want the chocolate cake or the ice cream or nothing at all. There's no general theory that I see would be tremendously helpful to import into the structure. Mainly what I am trying to clarify is that that is the nature of the structure. That's the point I'm making, rather than there being a preeminent way of choosing in that world which would have a level of uniformity, which would be absurd in food, but it would apply to identities. I'm saying it would be absurd to the identities as well. So, so I'm glad you gave me that clarificatory chance. Thank you. The, uh, the conversation continues just outside. Uh, Dr. Sen, many, many thanks for a magnificent lecture series in future years please come back and lecture to us again. Thank you very much.